thank you. We thank you for all that you did, for your completed work. Sure. 
Brandon and me the Bible. Oh. Ecclesiastes 5 today when we get there. It's after Proverbs, before Isaiah. In between there. Okay. <laughs> e. I know it's right there. It's on E. And you were all thinking it was funny that I was trying to find it for yeah, him too, right? <laughs> Me too. Anybody? 
and so am I. <laughs> but there's been many other appetites throughout my life. Being a teenager, we often joke teenagers about the sexual appetites that they struggle with. Throughout your whole life, you already are full aware of the appetites you have and how they affect you. <clears throat> we have to remember that they're instinctual in a lot of places. Influences by the five senses, touch, taste, smell, etc. Smell is your largest trigger. Uh, so as you're dealing with your flesh, as we go through this, think about what, what that is for you. Pride leads to self-righteousness. Wow, where do I, I can't go too far on that one. I'll get lost. Pride is a very large motivator to keep your flesh in charge. First thing it's going to say is, you got it all together. You don't even need God. Look, you got plenty of money, you got a roof, you're good, right? Pride. Let's go ahead and go to the next one, right? <clears throat> that was the flesh. <laughs> this is your soul. Feelings originate from your soul. The intellect of, of who you are. They are subject to what you are influenced by. Untamed emotions try to run the carnal flesh. And this is where the spirit becomes crucial because we have plenty of examples in our own lives and all the lives of the people we know about how this plays out. <laughs> right? Somebody hurts you and you're unforgiving. So by your fleshly nature, you're now protecting your soul, now you're just not going to let anybody get close. This won't happen again. That is being subject to what you are influenced by, untamed emotions, running the carnal flesh. God is contrary to that, right? We forgive people. And that doesn't produce a pattern in our life in protecting our soul. Let's go on to flesh right now. Oh, he knew. That one? Yes. The Spirit is the part of us that connects us to God. Only in connecting with God can the flesh, soul, and spirit be satisfied and content. <coughs> uh, again, I didn't hear you. I said scripture. Yeah, I know. I was thinking. <laughs> it's my transitions I had a problem with. <laughs> Yeah, that memory loss from the two. Many of the other things we covered in flesh and soul, uh, I just want to say, uh, bring no contentment. The true contentment and satisfaction comes from the relationship that we have with God. And I wanted to use uh, Ecclesiastes 5 uh, to, to pull all these things together. Solomon was obviously the wisest man who ever lived and had plenty of opportunity. And as I read through these, think of where you're at with your flesh, where that puts your soul, and how much spirit of God do you interact with, know, about. I don't want to say have, because we all have a measure once we've received Jesus. Amen. Okay, so in five... I'm going to start under the heading, and my Bible says, Riches are meaningless, which is 5 8. If you see the poor oppressed in a, in a certain area, and justice and the rights are denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and, the, oh, and over them both, and others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all the king himself profits from the fields. Solomon's essentially summing up how you derive to this problem of poverty. Obviously someone is over you, and yet someone is over them as well. And the king flourishes from the land. I think he's maybe breaking down how it can be if there's a rule of the bad king. But he's just setting the groundwork of explanation here. In 10, he says, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Dang it, I've been 
been there. I've made good money and was never happy. <laughs> just, it just doesn't bring it. And these, these are in contrast to what we would think and rationalize in our, in our soul, in our mind, in our body. In 11, he says, as good increase, uh, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes upon them? <laughs> 12, he says, the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. There's been many times I've been exhausted from work and had that sweet sleep that comes after a labor. Lester Summerall told a story of a school teacher they went to school with. He drove a Cadillac. He was a really well-to-do man. Obviously, his sole income was not his teaching job. But Lester said they always really esteemed him. As teenage boys, he was attractive. He wore the best suits. He had the Cadillac car. Lester said when he was in his senior year, he had an opportunity one day to take his lunch down there and have lunch with him. So Lester went down to his office and said he was sitting there eating lunch. And he asked the teacher why he wasn't eating. And he said, Lester, I haven't been able to eat a meal like you eat in 10 years. Because of his wealth, his stomach continually gave him problems because of all the concerns that it brought. And Lester said it was quite a shock to him because here he had really been esteeming this man. <laughs> and so it was the Lord's way of showing the truth to Lester. That, that story always stuck with me. It says, uh, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. As someone who has less money, it didn't come easy. But I feel that I have had more true joy, which in turn has brought happiness, than I ever had when I had riches. Amen. In 13, he says, I have seen this grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left of him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. It says wealth hoarded. We all see examples of that. Squandered to the point where there's even no inheritance for their children. Uh, there's a study out that something like 60% of all lottery winners end up destitute, jailed, drug addict, dead. Within a year, within 12 months. And I think that's part of those problems that Solomon is referring to that comes with wealth without the proper spiritual direction. And he makes it pretty plain that when we leave this world, we're going to leave it naked the way that we came into it. In 16, he says, As a man comes, so he departs. And what does he gain? Since he toils for the wind all his days, he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun. During the few days of life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot, and to be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. I like how Solomon says he seldom reflects. <laughs> Because I'll tell you what, when I'm in a bad place, or maybe when you're in a bad place, what's the first thing we do? Man, remember how it used to be? Yeah, 
we're reflecting back to the previous satisfaction that we were able to sustain in our flesh. But Solomon's saying, it still means nothing. It's rags. Then I realized this is a gift of God. He saw and reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness. Solomon goes on to say uh, other things that uh, man has tried to bring prosperity in. 6 3 says, A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, he says that it would be better to be a stillborn baby than to be that man. Mid 6 7. All man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. Flesh. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. Better be satisfied with what you see and what's in front of you than to let your appetite destroy you and actually rob you of what you have already that you're not seeing. I suppose this would be a proper place to quit. The more words, the less the meaning. <laughs> and how does that profit anyone? Twelve, six twelve. For who knows what is good for a man in life? During a few and meaningless days, he passes through a life, passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? After we're gone, that's it. Nobody's going to be giving you a report. If I die, nobody's going to report to me when my children graduated high school or if they got married or if they have children. When we die, that's it. Solomon says all these things that are worthless. And when I looked at my life when I first came across the scripture, I had a worthless life. I wasn't storing up anything but selfish pride. And Solomon clearly says that when we die, we're leaving this world as naked as we came into it. Now, I'm not saying it's not good to seek an education or to have a good job or to make money, but no that that is not where your life is at. It is not in the body, in the flesh. It can be in the soul through the Spirit of God. Who can tell them what will happen under the sun? So my urge today is that we would have a better understanding of all the things that we're confronting on a daily basis in our lives and that they have eternal meanings, that the things that we're struggling against are for God's spiritual reasons and for his kingdom's purposes. You know, the other main theme that Solomon is pulling out of everything he says here is that we are not the center of the universe. That was incredibly damaging to me when I heard that. I want to be the center of my world. I want to be the most important thing in my world. But it's not so. God is first. He is always first. And his plan to bring you to a place of spiritual understanding and to allow the spirit to drive you not the appetites of our flesh, truly brings contentment in the soul. Sometimes I have a difficult time receiving it 
Because my mind doesn't fully understand it. I, I lost a parent. It's a tragic thing. So it's going to happen to all of us. But I have a peace about that that I can't find anywhere in my mind or in my flesh. And those are the kind of things that God wants to do for us through His Spirit. Through my spirit, I can hear Him say, I know it hurts, but it's going to be okay. Someday we're all going to be back together. It's going to be all right. That revelation does not come through my mind. It comes through the Spirit. So my urge to you this week is, take an examination of your life. How much of what you're doing, thinking, and saying is truly for God's purpose? Because I'll tell you what, anything that's not His, that's working in your life, when you die and you leave this world naked, that's the only thing we get to take with us, is the works of God. Solomon says, everything else is trash. Everything else is going to be left behind. In fact, he goes on to explain the downfalls if we follow those things. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your ability to share your word. I thank you that as I share, that you sharpen me. Thank you for the gift of that. We exalt you, Jesus, in the work that you did. As we go through our next week, help us to see your spirit even more. Help us to understand it and put us in right standing. Get rid of our old thinking, our old rationales, and prepare us and move us and excel us further and faster in the plan of God in our life than ever before. Make it so, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If anybody would like prayer, the altar is open. Can you want to play a little guitar or something?